verse? I think we talked about this uh, a little bit yesterday already, and we we established uh, about 10k resources managed for management server node. Uh, pretty much scales out horizontally. And uh, it, uh, today we you do have to disable one particular uh, component uh, in our stats collector um, uh, in order for it to uh, scale out horizontally. And and we have real production deployments of uh, tens of thousands of uh, resources managed. Um, and in our internal our software simulator, uh, uh, using that, the, the, what, what we were demoing today, uh, we have been able to drive up to about 30k uh, physical resources, uh, with about 30k VM, so about one VM per resource, uh, uh, with four management server nodes. And we believe that we can at least double that scale uh, with, with, with some changes. Uh, So, um, so this is how, how we kind of uh, work on our scalability problem. Um, uh, one source of um, uh, uh, low of the uh, system is got to be the number of requests that comes in. And, and, and on the management server, we have two sets of worker uh, thread pools. Uh, one is provided by Tomcat. You know, uh, pretty much anyone who does an app server knows that. Uh, and then we, we actually have our own on job threads uh, waiting on the job queue ourselves. And the way that we divide it is that if the incoming requests uh, are mostly DB operations, and oftentimes when you're ser serving up a UI, right, that, that's the case, uh, then these things are just executed by the executor threads and, and the requests are returned back uh, to, the, to, the, to, to, to the client. And, and we do that because most of the requests are already low balanced by, by the low balancer, right? I, but if the incoming request needs resources, uh, meaning any of the physical resources, then and this usually means these things have long, long running durations, and they would usually uh, uh, require a lot more re uh, uh, resources, DB things like that. Uh, so what we do is we check it against ACL, make sure the guy can actually uh, execute that uh, um, request. And then we queue it. We queue it into into this um, uh, job management on layer, which today is backed by a database queue. Uh, and it gets picked up by uh, job threads. So in multiple management server cases, then the, those job threads are basically spread across the management um, uh, management layer. Whoever has three threads will pick them up. Um, the number of job threads are scaled to the number of DB connections available to the management server. So, so this is um, uh, uh, a bit of an interesting case is because uh, you have to be able to see, uh, look, I only got 500 dB connections, and you have to run some numbers, and, you, and the check comes out to be, uh, well, then that means you can only support this much in your th execution thread pool, or else a lot of your jobs would, would start failing. And, and we don't reserve one dB connection per thread. Uh, at, at the dB connections are returned back to the uh, DB connection pool as soon as possible uh, to, to maximize uh, its use. Uh, so then, and, and we work out some numbers to make sure that if you have this much with this many number of worker threads, uh, normally, uh, un unless you see some exceptions, uh, the, the, the system will not run, run out of DB connections. And, and, and so then the requests may take a long time because you, uh, let's say you configure 10 DB connections. Well, then you got maybe about five worker threads. As then and, and 100 requests come in, and that requires resources. Your those requests are going to take a long time because that you don't have enough worker threads and 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 um, and DB connections to make it work. Uh, but you can also increase it. At, you can scale your DB uh, that way, uh, uh, scale your uh, DB better, and and change it for management server, and, and the management server will uh, uh, will work better. Um, so there's actually a much harder problem. Um, uh, the, this is only for incoming requests, right? Uh, so anything that's generated by, from the user, from the administrator. But uh, those, those, unless you're under some sort of a, a DOS tag or, uh, some, uh, or someone who uh, was scripting against your uh, server and has a bug and, and sends thousands of requests to you, you know, uh, that, that, that's generally not the problem. The problem um, is, is CloudStack actually performs a lot of tasks on behalf of the administrator um, where it is trying to figure out what 
at what state the entire system is at. Uh, uh, these tasks include VM sync, sec um, <laughs> SG sync, security group syncing, and if security group is in enforced, uh, is, um, uh, hardware capacity monitoring, and virtual uh, resource usage statistics uh, to generate any of the usage data for building, things like that. Uh, I'm sure there will, that there is more than this, and there will be more to come. Um, and, so, and when you're do, doing the, these type of things in a number of uh, hundreds or maybe thousands, it's not a big deal. But when this number increases, then this, the, the problem manifests. So then the question is, how do you actually scale this as across the management servers? So um, it's not really two approaches, but let, let's do a comparison of um, two of the things that you see in, in Cloud Stack, where, where, these, where there are these background tasks that are doing on, um, uh, work on behalf of the administrator. Um, uh, there's a stats collector. Uh, this was written in our version 1.0 product uh, and still exists in Cloud Stack today. And this is the thing that, and, um, that I said you have to disable. Uh, it collects capacity statistics for the host, for the storage. It fires every five minutes to collect stats. As, and then and, um, it follows a smart server and dumb client, or what I call smart server and dumb client model, where basically the client just collects the information, and the information is always processed by the management server. Um, and it runs the, exactly the same way I've, I've on every single management server in the cluster. Um, uh, and then there is also VMSync. VMSync was also written in 1.0. Uh, um, it fires every minute. Uh, it follows what I call a peer-to-peer -peer model, uh, where the resource is, is trusted to do the right thing, and when it returns information. And there is a, what we call a full sync and on, on connecting to the resource. Uh, this means every, all information about that particular VM, uh, about VMs on that particular host, are, are returned back to the management server uh, and compared to what, what was on the management server. Uh, and then from there on, it does what we call a delta sync. And, and a delta sync means that only our band changes actually gets transferred back to the management server. Um, and uh, VM sync is only run against the resources that are connected to a specific management server node. So the um, other management server um, resources connected to management server node two is never doing a VM sync against management server one. Um, so uh, let's do some numbers. Uh, so in approach, so we, we assume about 10k hosts, about 500k VMs. You know uh, that's fairly reasonable nowadays with 50 VMs per host. Uh, you know, on the stats collector, it fires off 10k requests every five minutes. It's about 33 requests a second. And it's not too bad. You know, a, a big server probably can still handle that. Uh, occupies 33 threads every second um, because each thread is waiting and on um, uh, agent connections uh, or, or commands that are being uh, executed on the, on the resource. Uh, but there's more. Because it does the exact same thing for, for each management server, as you scale the management servers, it gets worse. Uh, on two management servers, it goes 66 requests. Three, it goes 99. You know? Then it, it scales in, in it, the number of requests it generates actually scales on the, uh, with the number of management servers. Quick question on that is, so are you guys actually distributing the request so it will be X per second, or are you going to get hit with however well, many thousand requests? this is actually already distributed because if you look at it, it's 10K requests for five minutes. So it's 10K divided by 300 seconds. So this is 33 requests per second already. But so is it, that's what I'm saying. It's only going to do so many every second, or is it... Do you have, is that stats collector when it fires off after five minutes going to go 10,000 and go fetch? Yeah, so uh, it, um, it goes off, well, it's distributed because the, it has, it's it a, single, it. a single thread firing off these requests, right? So, so it, it does get distributed over the five minutes. Uh, uh, but, but that's not really it, uh, the big problem here. The big problem is the sh a sheer number of requests it generates is already overwhelming. And, and so then, it, and, and it gets worse. Because that's just the number of requests. As when in, in the management server, there are certain resources connected to one, ser one management server and uh, another set uh, connected to a second management server. And because it generates the same, same requests on both sets, 
then these requests also get cross routed. Uh, and there are threads handling the, that cross routing. And so the number of threads it occupies is actually much higher. Um, and so our, our notice is that when, when, when these things happen, and, or when this guy is running, and the management server is at 20% busy, even with no load from incoming requests at all. Uh, so that, that, that's one thing. And uh, whereas on VM sync, what we do is we fire off one request at resource connection time. It syncs about 50 VMs, takes a, takes a few seconds, you know, five to 10 seconds. And then it, then it pushes uh, um, from the resource because we trust the resource to know the things that it has in the last uh, sync point. And, and, and it only sends out uh, changes that, that were not expected on the management server. And the, and, and the management server uh, respects the fact that uh, the resource is some, will do something correct. Uh, so essentially, we have no thread occupied for a much larger data set because this data set is for, 50, is for 500 KVMs and, and there's nothing, uh, not much processing at all uh, happened for VM sync. And so, oh, so uh, an interesting thing about this, so, so I kind of wrote VM sync, right? I'm, the, uh, I'm pretty smart. Uh, the guy who wrote um, the stats collector uh, is still with us. He's our director of engineering now. So that's the difference between management and an engineer. I'm just kidding, but Will, Will, Will is a really smart guy. Uh, this, this was obviously a 1.0 product, so. Uh, but it's still in here during, uh, for 3.0. Um, so, what, what, so obviously I, I believe VM Sync is great, right? But what's the downside of VM Sync? And the resources uh, have to reconcile the VM stakes by the management server uh, and, VM, uh, and, and the VM stakes that it has. So it has to do more, more work, more work than the management server. Um, uh, and so then therefore the resources uh, require more CPU. Um, and then the resources uh, also need to uh, use a lot more memory uh, because there's a lot of information to keep track of for each VM. Um, but the great thing is that in the data center, these two resources are abundant. There's, there's plenty. If, you don't, if, if one VM is not enough, you create another VM. Um, um, start off 10, 10, 20, 30 resources uh, and, and it will be plenty. Uh, so uh, so uh, we're making use of things that are actually abundant inside the data center versus things that are not. Uh, and so then, and it goes on to the uh, I also want to uh, dive into this uh, other problem a little bit uh, of this stats collector. Uh, not only is the algorithm a, a problem, um, but it, it's also a problem because it did, it did not divide its work depending on the number of management servers. So it gets worse because everyone is handling every single object in, inside the, um, uh, uh, in, in that, that's managed by a management server. Um, so in CloudStack, uh, we have a, a load balancing of all um, management and resources. As you add another management server into, in, into the cluster, um, the management server will uh, signal, will, will pick some um, VMs, I'm sorry, uh, will pick some resources, and it will signal to another management server and says, you need to hand this over to me because we're go I'm, 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 I'm here to offload some of your work. Our, our management server one will wait for the uh, c commands on the resource to finish, as, and then it will hold all further commands in the queue. Then MS1 will tell MS2, you can now take over. MS2 connects to it, signals back to MS1 to complete the transfer, and MS1 will discard the resource it was holding and, and flows the commands or routes the commands over to MS2 to, to be executed, uh, uh, to, be, to be sent down to the resource. Uh, and, and so then we can do a very seamless um, uh, rebalancing of, of resources handled in, in, a, in the cloud, uh, in, in the management cl uh, cluster. Uh, uh, the listeners, are, and then what we do is we allow you to register listeners as to, as to, to see what, management uh, what resource is connected to which management server or has disconnected. And then you can actually uh, process those. Um, uh, you can uh, do your processes according to what resources is on your management server. So then, you, 
by, by doing that, then you are automatically balanced uh, as management servers go in and out of the cluster. Um, and it also reduces the amount of message routing and between the management servers. So it kills two birds with one stone. Um, any questions? So designing for scalability. So these, these are kind of the lessons that we, we learned. On, on, so one, one thing unique about cloud uh, is that there's abundant CPU and RAM. And, and in our design, in the management server design, we take full advantage of those, uh, those, those, those two resources. Uh, auto scale to the least abundant resource and in, in, inside a cloud management layer, uh, that's actually your, the number of DB connections that you have. Uh, so you need to auto scale uh, to it because if you lost the number of DB connections, and things will start failing and and left or right. I uh, and so you need to be able to auto scale to that. Uh, um, and and I think I think I, I mentioned this before. Do not hold DB connections across resource calls because the resource calls usually take a long amount of time. I'm and usually in if let's say you start a transaction and then you. You start a 10 minute uh, resource call, by the time you come back, that transaction would have rolled back because it would have, uh, it would have timed out. Uh, and no matter what amount of timeout you put in, and you, you can always find a case where, where it took longer than that timeout uh, uh, on the resources. Uh, so uh, we advocate using lock table implementations if you really do require locks across resources. Uh, um, there, there is an implementation line for that called Merovingian 2, uh, um, which is also uh, um, created by our generic uh, DAO, which is used by in, uh, our method called, called um, uh, acquire lock in table uh, in generic DAO. Um, we're, we're perfectly fine with database roll locks, but it's got to be very quick. And, and we will check uh, when you send messages over to the resource that you are not in a database transaction. And, and we we will assert our if 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 we see that, um, um, and then balance your resources, uh, um, the, the the tasks that you have, uh, on the management servers, and 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 as it increases and decreases, get notified so that you can, and so um, uh, so then you can adjust to to that, and using job queues so that you can and. First, store the number of jobs that you have, and then process them as they uh, as your, your resources become available. Um, okay, that's uh, basically what I have for scalability. Any questions? Um, you say database is an issue, but uh, what about spreading out reads and writes over different databases? Will it make any difference if I mean, it's possible? But we're only talking to one database. Uh, yes, but um, is it very expensive for the management service to connect to the database? For example, uh, API calls which only involve reading, would mm -hmm. it be? Would it make any difference? Ah, I see. Yeah. Oh, it, 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 it absolutely will make a difference. And and so then there there is a different um, level of scalability in terms of how to scale the database. Uh, is that's you know uh, we can get a DB admin and or someone to go work on that. Because that would be um, somewhat transparent to, to cloud stack. Uh, because uh, inside our DAO layers, inside our transaction layers, we can always say, oh, if it's re-operation, go to this particular uh, endpoint. And, and if it's right operation, go, go to the master, for example. Uh, so it, it's possible. But that's why it's not included in this. OK. In, in this. So you could read from the slaves, right? Yeah, that's, that's exactly what we is talking about. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the uh, next question. Um, so we learn a lot about reliability with CloudStack. And anybody who runs a data center would kind of know this already. So I might be preaching to the choir here. Uh, but I'm going to preach anyways. Uh, so it's the five W's of unreliability. Uh, what is unreliable? And it would be everything. Everything will fail. Everything will break down. Um, who is unreliable? It will always be the developers and administrators. And, and it turns out the end users are actually more reliable because they are very reliable to call you, you know, when there's something wrong. You know, uh, you restrict a lot of them, 
and there will be no problem uh, I'm sure what they're doing and then something goes wrong they will give, definitely give you a call um, and when does unreliability happen it's always 3 or 4 a.m. you know uh, or I, I'll, I'll take the answer anytime I'm um, where does it happen and in very carefully planned everything has been considered the data centers uh, so no matter what you do it still will happen and um, and how does it add uh, happen, you know, uh, kind of just happens, and because you can't you can't plan for everything that that can happen, and 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 one thing I want to talk about uh, is that uh, in the who uh, who is unreliable case uh, is for the developers. I mean, people make make mistakes as administrators and things like that, but for developers, you 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 will have bugs, and that's that's what causes unreliability, right? I'm. Um, so, uh, how do you deal with this? So, the one thing that you, you, you should do is don't assume anything. And so, uh, and I have a kind of a story about this. As I, and it really kind of relates, relates to me very well. Uh, I, um, I purchased a Toyota Prius, about 2009 Toyota Prius. It's a good little car, uh, runs pretty well, saves a lot of gas. And when about and Thanksgiving last year, then I drove it down to LA, and on the way back, I was in stop and go traffic, and, and there was a long stretch of time where people would just stop. So I turned off the car, and when the traffic starts to go again, and it wouldn't start up. Uh, and I looked and I looked, and I could not figure out why it wouldn't start up. Then I thought, ah, it, is, it doesn't start up. Let me at least push it off the road, and, and let the traffic beside me go, right? I can't push it off the road. You cannot shift it into neutral uh, when the battery is dead. Yeah, because the whole thing is controlled by software. And whoever uh, made that software assume you will always have electricity. And it is just the worst thing ever. I, I just could not believe it. There were, there were people yelling at me, uh, yelling at my kids. My kids were climbing around in the back of my car. I still have a message on my uh, on my phone um, with Toyota support where people where, where I'm trying to get uh, get them to pay me for my bad experience. Okay? I just could not believe these guys. I, I, I thought of that, but but I do the same thing when I write software because I assume something is not going to fail. Oh, uh, and 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 at one point my VP of engineering when I told him this story he says, "Oh, karma, uh, karma sucks, right?" <laughs> <laughs> because I did, I did the exact same thing when I was writing, and and a lot of engineers would would do a lot of the same things. And so it's very important that you, you don't assume that things just do not fail, um, and don't bang your head against the wall. Uh, and and I, I don't mean that li literally. And uh, uh, don't bang your head against the wall means that when when you're writing the code, uh, if something fails, you should think about uh, uh, why it failed. And whether or not it should, you should retry. And there will be code that retries all the time. Who was on the death list here? Yeah? Uh, who, who sent out the email that says, why are you spamming me with the bill fails? That happened just before this, this uh, conference. Did you all get it? You know, that's bang your head against the wall. You know, it failed already, man. Stop trying it. You know, at least know that it happened. So, uh, and CalStack actually requires a lot of work in that. We're, we're, we're really in the infancy of learning, learning these lessons. And it's because uh, we're, we are trying to get it to a point where uh, we can, an, an administrator can stop the operations in CalStack and keep, and so that it doesn't, um, they don't need to uh, keep looking at the same exceptions throughout CalStack. And, and I, I, I like to relate that to you because that's, this is a lesson that we learn. Um, you know, uh, know when you don't know any better. Um, so I think one thing that uh, developers uh, think is software is magical. Uh, and and I, I, I like to believe that. And, and, and it really is because it creates a lot of magical things. And, but the fact is that there, is, there comes a time when, when you're in the data center and the only person who knows what went wrong is that administrator sitting, go, going to the source of the, uh, what went wrong and looking at it. Uh, you sitting there assume, assuming that it will come back, it will get, get better, or would be, a, would be the wrong choice. Uh, so you have to stop and tell, alert someone, 
and ask them to help you. Ask the administrators to help you. Uh, um, uh, so uh, in Cloud Stack, that's, that's, uh, we, we put in a lot of uh, different things for that. So for example, in Cloud Stack, we can, uh, when you stop a VM, um, our VM is in a, in a, in a poor state. Right, because let's say we send um, the start command over to a certain resource, and the resource never came back, uh, and it takes it, it takes a long time for it to come back, and it's stuck it's stuck at that uh, um, time. And then when you go, uh, uh, says when you say oh, I want to stop the VM, um, callstack goes to look at it, and but callstack can't reach the resource again, and so I cannot tell you the VM has stopped, uh, because I cannot re reach the resource to confirm that it stopped. Uh, but an administrator can do that. An administrator can go look, uh, can go there, or he can go through a DDRAC and, and just drop, drop the power connection on the host because it is in bad order, right? I, uh, but to cause that, even though if you did that, I couldn't, I couldn't reach the uh, host. What can I do? Uh, so uh, we've added flags uh, for these stop commands that says, just go ahead and release because I know better than, than you. Uh, know better than your software. Uh, on what to do. Um, so uh, when you're writing software, that's, that's the things that you actually have to consider uh, uh, in terms of unreliability. So, but there are things that CloudStack Act does in terms of um, making sure that unreliability does not uh, affect the data integrity inside CloudStack. Is uh, Kelvin here? Okay, so Kelvin is, a, uh, is another architect on, um, on CloudStack, and he wrote majority of these things. And where the management service in the cluster will keep a heartbeat and, and with the DB, uh, and it will self-fence if it cannot write the heartbeat, uh, while other uh, management servers will alert uh, to, to its components that a certain management server is now uh, no longer writing to the heartbeat and probably have self-fenced. And, 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 and the code that we do on start VM, on, on uh, a number of our VM operations, and actually checkpoints, so that if one management server has been deemed to gone down, then another management server will come back and says, as uh, you're at this checkpoint, roll, roll it back. Uh, 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 and, and there might be uh, places where you cannot, like for example, uh, where we have already sent the start to the resource, and we don't know for sure if the resource uh, has, has, um, uh, has started the VM or not. Uh, and in those cases, then we need the administrator's help. Uh, and we provide the APIs for the administrators to help us. Uh, as, you know, and, and we guard against our own mistakes by, by, not, by not actually deleting the rows from the database as, as, so that someone can actually go through and says, oh, um, I, can, I can actually recover certain things and from, uh, from, from the database or see at least what happened in terms of the data. Um, uh, and someone would need to go through and and write some scripts to clean up the database every so often, but it wouldn't be, it, it's not too, too difficult to do that. Um, you know, write code that is item potum, that write code that says, I'm gonna check these things each time, um, and then and, and repeat those things each time, um, so that uh, if I was at a certain stage before, I know how to go uh, from that stage again. And, and write code that, uh, so that we, we use this code, code that, that, um, uh, that, that's been proven versus a different branch of code. Uh, so I, I, one, one example of that I have is that on, man, on a management server going down, um, our, our resource connections are exactly the same uh, as when the management server starts up. It goes through the exact same code. We don't have a, we don't have a separate line of code that says, uh, as, oh, if, if this management server go down, um, this is what you do. Uh, what we do is mark all the resources as disconnected, and then we have separate threads that brings them up as, and, and let it compete against other management servers to, to load. Uh, so that it automatically spreads across uh, uh, the remaining management servers. Uh, things like that where, where we use the same code for different situations. And, uh, same thing with HA that I was talking about yesterday. We use the same startup code. Uh, uh, we just do a few more extra steps before that to ensure the startup code uh, is back at the condition that, that it expects it to be. And, uh, and respect modularity when you write your code because one of the wor worst things is that you go across boundaries to th fix something that you think you know what you're doing and then actually it turns out it doesn't. Um, so, um, any questions?
or comments? Okay, so I guess we're gonna get to the free form portion of our of our uh, uh, discussion. So who are the developers here? <laughs> oh no, I meant the cloud stack developers because they, they need to come up here and and help. Ah, uh, um, Frank. Questions about bare metal? Yeah, I actually didn't, didn't have a one prepared because I wasn't sure if it, there's anybody here who is uh, working on hypervisors. Uh, but Frank is the one who implemented the bare metals, so uh, he'll he'll be able to answer. Hey, you can just use this. So I don't have any slides, so you, if you have any questions, you can ju just ask. So about. Oh, okay, so oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have any uh, preparation. So, so <coughs> currently we are working on the bare metal tool in cloud stack. So at the very beginning, the one year back, we uh, started working on the bare metal one. It basically, uh, it used a PXE server to store the, the disk image. Disk image, and then you can just like, uh, okay, let, let me arrange my mind. So how to describe. Okay, so so in cloud stack, basically uh, you manage the virtualization VM, and uh, the bare metal. I let you have a, a capability to manage the real host as the VM in cloud stack. So you can control the real uh, host, the bare metal host, like uh, just a VM in cloud stack UI. So what? <coughs> so the technology is uh, behind it is the PXE and the the IPMI. So basically, you can and a bare metal host as a user host, like the then server in cloud stack host page. And basically you need to fill up the MAC address, the IPM, IPMI address. IPMI is a protocol to control the, the bare metal host. So once you've done it, you have to re register an image. The image in cloud, uh, cloud stack bare metal one is a ping image. The ping is an open source software you can use this software to take a whole disk image from the bare metal host. And then once you have it, you, you can register it in cloud stack UI, just like a template of the uh, virtualization template. And then you can uh, go to the, uh, the instance page and uh, select the service offering to specify you want to spring up a bare metal VM and uh, specify the template name and then cloud stack will pick up a host from the bare metal host, uh, bare metal host cluster and then provisioning <coughs> that image on that host. So basically we use IPMI to set the host to nest start as a PXE start. And then we program the DHCP server to assign the IP address to, to that host and give the, the link to where, the, where to get the template. And then we use IPMI to reboot the, the host once the host spring up, it uses PXE to download the image. So basically, uh, we will run, run a small Linux kernel in, in RAM and uh, prepare a RAM disk and mount the NFS, NFS share, and then use the ping software to clone the image to your disk. So once it's done, so in cloud stack UI, the the bare metal host just like a VM, like, like a virtualization VM. So you can manage. Both virtualization VM and the bare metal bare metal machine in the same UI and with the same constraints. So that's back. okay. Okay, and a question: uh, the DHCP server, how is it provisioned and where is it running? Because there's no oh yeah, you need a host where DHCP is running on. Yeah, so so basically, um, in cloud stacks, we call we call the part part is a broadcast broadcast domain. So basically, uh, before you uh, provision the bare metal host, you need to uh, run. Start a VM or what machines in that part, or install a, a, a CentOS or, or whatever. So we you then you register this host with IP address as a password and account in cloud stack. So we control the 
we control the DHCP D demo or the DMS MySQL demo on that on that server as our DHCP server. So. Okay. So do you need hardware uh, IPMI that the it on the motherboard in order to use your cloud stack on bare metal? So you mean the IPMI protocol version or? You, you need the hardware on the, oh, on the motherboard? Yeah. So basically, yeah, we need the IPMI support in BIOS of the host. But currently, almost all the uh, server hosts have that capability. Yeah. I had a question. So oh. you were talking about the oh. images. Okay. So uh, is there any mechanism to transfer the VM image back into, so the templates into the physical one or? Is there anything? To yeah, that, that, that is possible. So basically, right now, there are multiple, the, the, like, the PIC, uh, how, how to call it? So the P2V or V2P, the image convert. So uh, basically, we, if we uh, write a tool ourselves, we can convert the Zen server VHD image to the, the host, host disk format. We can directly provision the VHD image on the host, but currently, Cloud Stack only supports that. Uh, question: Does a, a bare metal host need an agent software install, or is it? Uh, right now, we we don't need because basically what we are doing is just clone the the template onto a host. We we never touch the the inside of the operating system. But in bare metal two, we we are supported the the Kickstart file. So right now, we just clone the like a ghost, clone the image to to the disk. In bare metal two, we will use a Kickstart file to install the, the Linux operation system. And then we will support the, the secure group. Secure group, uh, you guys may know it's a firewall in cloud stack. Then we will install an agent in, in the uh, operation system. Then we can just use the same, uh, make the, uh, same tool in secure group to program the, the bare metal host. Yeah. Oh, so, oh, oh sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, for which action do you need uh, IPMI? Uh, only to boot it with uh, yes. VXA? Or so basically, we need the, the boot, reboot, and stop the, the host with the IPMI tool. But you can also do that with uh -huh. power commands, but it's not supported. Wait, 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 which command? No, I mean, um, uh -huh. uh, a lot of old. Uh, servers uh, oh. don't have IPMI. Oh and yeah, yeah. Because um, when we design the bare metal in cloud stack, we just choose the, the what's the popular the technology uh, current like server using. So IPMI is the first thing comes in, in my mind. Yeah, but yeah, but for latency, the server uh, currently we can't, we can't support that. But, but it should be possible to build it also uh, with the power commands for servers like start stop. Uh, well, um, so I'm still not sure what 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 will. Uh, if you don't of, have IPMI on the server, if you don't have IPMI, uh, I don't know how to, how to control the remote remote host. Like the APC. Uh, oh, yeah, that's the power strip. Yes. Okay. The, oh, yeah. So if that that is possible, we we can uh, also support in cloud stack because we are just the integration. If there is some tool in Linux, we can send the command to the host. We can just use that integrated with the cloud stack. Okay. Yeah. So, why Kickstart uh, for okay. for bare metal two O? Uh, Kickstart. While I'm perfectly happy with Kickstart, uh, there are a lot of operating systems that barely support Kickstart or don't support it at all. So, can you can you tell me a little bit about why the the choice for that and not something <laughs> a little. Not you know breaking that piece out and using something that isn't cloud stack to handle provisioning for those bare metal hosts. So the question is why we choose the Kickstart file as a technology for bare metal tool? Am I right? Yeah. So yeah. So so sometimes you need to make the decision because <laughs> because right most customers uh, are using the uh, Red Hat based the the Linux operation system. And the Kickstar file is the default for the Red Hat. So we, we just want to first, the first step, we just support the most popular the technology in the world. And then we can just uh, step by step to extend our, our, our the technology to cover more 
operating systems. Yeah, there's, there's no technical uh, the issues here, I think. I just wonder, you know, if you if you do kickstart, then uh -huh. you know the next. If you wanted to do some other type of operating system, then you'd have to have uh, yeah continue so, to layer those on. So you can for the operating system only support the kickstart. You can go back to the bare to the one one zero to so just clone the disk image and register as a template. Because for the for the template, there is no limitation for the what 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 sort of the operating system. For Windows, uh, yeah. the ghosting works better, right? Uh, yeah, the, the, for Windows, uh, I'm not sure if ghosting is, is better, but uh, uh, but because we are using the yeah, small Linux kernel, so the part image may be the default tool for that purpose. <laughs> I, I'm not sure if ghost support Linux, I really don't know. So I see a lot of provisioning tools that are starting to, to have an API. Um, the one that immediately jumps to my mind is Cobbler, mm -hmm. that you could have sitting there as a service that you integrate with mm -hmm. and require them to use. And then CloudStack just talks to the Cobbler API, which takes care of, and, and Cobbler, because it's a provisioning tool rather than an um, infrastructure as a service tool, knows how to deploy uh, everything from switch uh, stuff to you know, yeah. whatever. See, actually, I, I, I'm still looking for the open source uh, some, some kind of the PKC infrastructure to do such things. Actually, at the bare metal one zero, so at the very beginning, we try to integrate with uh, what 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 called is a Limin. Limin is a uh, commercial what whatever PKC PKC uh, framework. But at last, it won't work because because you know sometimes you you integrating with some not uh, software, you don't know what what the underlying implementation. And at the very last, when customer did it, and it, it have some trouble, and you cannot figure out <laughs> that that's a really bad experience. So for bare metal uh, one zero, which was a ping, and, and it's, it's open source. And and you're suggesting, I I think Coral may maybe a candidate. I will look. Yeah, I, actually, I I already looked look looked at it before, but uh, it's, it's a couple of months ago. Uh, yeah, and really there are many candidates. We just want to choose the. Most uh, proper proper one for the bare metal two there. Well, yeah, I'm I'm happy to to start the discussion about the uh, bare metal provisioning tools on the mailing list, and maybe we cool. Can, yeah, we can, can start the discussion on the other than, yeah. than ours involved in that. This is something I'm very interested in as well. Uh -huh. uh, the whole stateless provisioning of hypervisors and running them uh, gives you a lot of flexibility. Mm -hmm. I think we heard uh, Peter from Disney commenting that that's how they're running their system. Uh -huh. uh, it's just it's kind of a natural extension, uh, and, and it seems like the, the perfect operating model for running uh, cloud stack based cloud. Mm -hmm. What could be even a addition to it if you have IP mic control over all hypervisors in the night when demand is low, you could also shut them down. Yeah, uh, to save power. If you're you could even do that without IP mic. Well, well <laughs> yeah, yeah, but get him up, get him up again. Well, yeah, I, I want to be careful. Though. <laughs> I don't want to see anything tied too tightly into IPMI. Uh -huh. Because if it's there, if it provides a benefit, but there's an awful lot of uh, cloud hardware out there these days that yeah. don't have IPMI. Oh, no, IPMI. Well, suggests and IPMI is, means a lot of different things, too, right? So <laughs> just because you have IPMI st stamped <laughs> on, the, uh, on the literature doesn't mean that that implementation is going to be the same across all hardware. Right. That, that's fairly standard, especially with later IPMI implementations. But you know, if you get much past start, stop, or start reboot, you're you're wandering into the dangerous territory. And that that comes back. Do we really want CloudStack to become a hardware management? Maybe we do. Maybe we don't. <laughs> maybe yeah. we want to interface with something that has a nice API that does that already. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's just a choice. Yeah, but it could be a pluggable service or something where you can say, okay, use IPMI for shutting this host down or use a power a PDU for this or yeah. whatever is available. Correct. But the point is you could, you could scale out your machines whenever demand is low, shut them down and bring them up again. It could save a lot of power and a lot of money. Yeah. Correct.
So actually, we, uh, I, I, I was thinking if we can just uh, use bare metal to provision the hypervisor, then that will be easier to manually install the Linux server KVM. Then, then, so we provide the total solution, both uh, for virtualization and the manage the hardware. That would be easier to customer. But don't you do have then the problem with uh, different uh, disk size? If uh, you disk just, size, yeah. So if you use the, yeah. Yeah. So images. for for mental, uh, one, the the pin image can handle that. So basically, if you the image the image only eight, uh, eight gb size, and you have hundred gb size disk, it will fill zero to the empty empty disk and to expand the whole disk. That that's solved. Uh, that was solved by the image format. Mm 